Uh, thank you for coming to our presentation about um, taking security to the edge of the factory floor. Um, I am Andrew Gracie. I am the product manager of industrial IoT and manufacturing at SUSE. And I'm Quinn. I'm a second analyst for Voyant working with Linkerd. Hi. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk through a couple different things. Um, we're, I'm going to give a quick overview of uh, kind of cloud native and edge and why how those two things work together. Uh, Flynn's going to talk about uh, why specifically we're using uh, Linkerd um, and then the Linkerd architecture. Then we're going to talk a little bit about extending the service mesh, uh, which is really the interesting part here. Give you a quick demo, talk about where we're going next, and then some time for Q&A. So, got to make sure this actually builds correctly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so actually the timing here works out really nicely because there was actually a blog um, by Stephen O'Grady uh, on Friday about how edge is, uh, is really just an overloaded term. Uh, everybody has their own definition of edge and none of them actually match. So I'm going to give my own definition of edge and just, you know, contribute to the problem. Uh, so You mean you're going to clarify for everybody else? Oh, yeah, sure. We'll see. <laughs> um, so Edge, to me, is really all about the devices that we want to connect to. Um, we're just going to keep going and assume yeah, this is going to fix gonna itself. Yeah, we're going to roll with it, and you know, maybe yeah. I'm just going to unplug this and plug it back in and see what happens. Um, you know, turn it off, turn it back on. Uh, so I found it. Come on. It, the, okay. There we go. And then up, and back to that cool awesome now I know how to do that uh, yeah so edge is really all about the devices that we want to connect to uh, and we want to enable the flow of events and data between these devices uh, so that we can actually build like a useful control loop um, this control loop is tied uh, is actually the compute that we want to move closer to the devices that are being controlled uh, and that's really kind of the the main crux of edge is moving all that compute closer to um, and shortening that that control loop so that you actually get uh, less lat latency uh, and just generally a a safer more secure easier to manage environments hopefully easy to manage um, so most of our IoT devices are connected to a gateway, uh, at least historically. This is uh, a part of uh, the OT kind of world, uh, and a lot of the specs that they actually, the kind of the best practices that they have. Um, and then the, those gateways are all then connected to the servers uh, that are running the actual control loop logic, as well as things like historian, uh, a historian, digital twin, you want to get really fancy metaverse. There's all sorts of compute that goes on right there. Um, yeah. So let's use Kubernetes with it, right? Uh, we, we Even might. if we don't want to, a bunch of other people already are. Yeah. So we may as well roll with it. Exactly. Uh, it's got the right tooling around it. Uh, people really like uh, GitOps uh, for yeah, configuration management, uh, deployment management, kind of all of that. And this is really where the cloud native piece comes in, right? I'm going to be really reductionist here and say that cloud native is really um, the. I just realized. Okay. Before the demo went to sleep and caused issues later, um, the um, it's really about being able to be declarative with, with your configuration and then have a reconciliation loop that always self heals into uh, the desired state. So, and lastly, it's popular. So it's what we can hire for, it's what skill sets are actually out there, and um, that's honestly a, a really big uh, piece of calculus for it. So, um, now we need to think about like how the how the communication is actually happening. So, the uh, the gateway to device communication is uh, going to be done through things like serial protocols, USB protocols, uh, really any number of protocols: OPC UA, Modbus, Profinet, LoRaWAN, Bluetooth Flow Energy, uh, as well as almost every single vendor of devices has their own proprietary protocol, and it's really annoying. 
You forgot IEEE 488. Thank you. <laughs> can't, forget, can't forget that one. Uh, and these do tend to be reasonably secure. You might argue LoRaWAN. You might argue Bluetooth Low Energy. On a, yeah, well, we'll see. There are things that can be done to make them secure, and they, yeah. people tend to think a little bit about that. So it's better than ClearText TLS over Wi-Fi. For sure. Which we tend to have a lot of, too. Yes. Uh, so then uh, the gateway to cluster network is uh, potentially uh, less secure, let's say. Uh, it could be just some unsecure network. Uh, it could be going out to the cloud. Uh, it could be over Wi-Fi, right? Uh, it could be satellites. Um, so it could be flaky. It could be massively unreliable. It could be slow. We would like to change all of those things. Right, all sorts of issues. So we know how to solve this problem, right? Let's add our service mesh. Specifically, one more build. Linkerd. <laughs> <laughs> and for the a little bit better explanation of why Linkerd, I'm going to turn it over. As we do the dance of trying not to break any cables while we swap spaces. Um, yeah, Linkerd. Linkerd is a good choice for stuff like this. It's low overhead. You can run it on relatively low powered devices because it doesn't consume a lot of resource. Uh, it's built to be easy to configure and secure from the ground up. This is why it's all written in Rust instead of other things like that. And a particularly nice thing for this particular application is that Linkerd is also completely independent of your network topology. So it doesn't actually care whether you have these things in multiple clusters, in the same cluster, whether there's the public internet between them, whether it's a satellite, whether it's a VPC. It's built to cope with all of that. In terms of architecture, Linkerd is a service mesh. A service mesh is an infrastructure layer that provides security and reliability and observability at a platform layer, layer blah, platform level underneath your entire application so that you don't actually have to change anything about your application. The way that we do this in Linkerd, like in many service meshes, is by sticking user space proxies next to all of your application pods and then redirecting the network so that all of the communication goes through the proxies so that the proxies get to mediate everything. They can enforce MTLS, they can do retries, they can do circuit breaking, whatever, again, without having to change the application. But they also get to measure it, and so they can immediately start reporting statistics on how many of these things are working, what is failing, and they can do this uniformly across the entire application. Um, we also tend not to talk about it very much, but there is a control plane. The data plane, which again, ultra lightweight proxy is written in Rust so they are safe. The data plane is wrangling your data and then the control plane is wrangling all the proxies. So, things that are special about Linkerd. One of the big ones is if you take Linkerd and you mesh your application into it and you do absolutely nothing else, you will have security out of the box. I'm not going to lie, you do have to do some extra configuration to get retries or circuit breaking or whatever, all the reliability things, because we do not have the capability to know right out of the box what can be retried, for example. But that's pretty easy, right? Ultralight, in this case, you're talking about megabytes of RAM as opposed to gigabytes of RAM. Uh, latency is often harder to measure, but there are most situations we can be bringing in latencies down in under a millisecond for the proxy itself. It's very simple to operate. We have made a point of focusing on operational simplicity with Linkerd. You do not need an army of SREs to run it. Uh, and I've already mentioned security out of the box. So one of the questions we get every so often is, oh, well, how do I disable MTLS in Linkerd? And the short answer is you kind of can't. Um, I think there's a way to, well, I mean, there's a way we can do things like, oh, no, no, you need to skip this particular port that's coming in from the ingress. But that's about it. Other than that, you're going to get MTLS whether you want it or not. And you will get identity checking whether you want it or not, because that's part of MTLS. Um, let's see. I already mentioned that the microproxy is in Rust. It is not Envoy, despite the fact that everybody loves to build service meshes out of Envoy. Let me be clear. I am the original author of Emissary Ingress. Emissary is based on Envoy. There's a whole lot of stuff I really like about Envoy. 
but not if you're talking about running thousands of them in a cluster. Don't do that. Use something smaller and lighter that's built for the task and could be better at it. That is the Rust proxies. Uh, I can also point out here that, actually two things. One is, we get a lot of really cool asynchronous stuff and state-of-the-art networking, uh, in large part because a lot of the Linkerd maintainers have been contributing that to the rest of the Rust ecosystem. And the other thing I should point out here is that philosophy that the proxy really should be an implementation detail. If you're using an Envoy-based proxy, you will typically need to hire people who are experts with Envoy. As far as I know, the only experts in the Linkerd proxy are the Linkerd maintainers, which we really like, because you should be able to use a service mesh without being an expert in the proxy that's slinging the data around. That should not be necessary. So, um, Actually, I think let's hand it back over to you to talk yeah. about some of the challenges here, and I'll heckle, or something like that. Yeah. So some of the challenges that we run into, um, kind of taking a step back to this architecture, um, is the question of, like, should these be Kubernetes, right? Should all the gateways no. actually be running Kubernetes, right? Easy question. Okay, not always. Cool. We're done. Let's go to lunch. Uh, <laughs> so... But, but why not, right? Uh, there's a few reasons, right? The first is not everything is Greenfield, right? Uh, we've got a lot of, of uh, devices that are already out, in, already out in the field, right, that we have to integrate with. Uh, some applications are just not appropriate for Kubernetes, right? Uh, for example, we've got that robot there or the Bunsen burner, and those might actually have hard real-time requirements. Yeah. Right. You probably don't want Kubernetes to be getting in the way of things with hard real-time. You're going to be real scared about what a lot of cars are doing. Uh, that's true. Uh, um, I, I'm going to go hide in the corner now and weep uh, for life decisions or something. Um, we also, uh, as you might have noticed, we're actually running on battery power up here, right? So we're really concerned about uh, power consumption. Um, we're also concerned about simplification, simplification, right? Every component that you add is a chance for something to break within reason. <laughs> and there's, uh, lastly, there's an economic choice, right? Um, why make our users spend more money on their devices if they don't need to? Especially when we're talking about IoT devices where we're talking about millions of these things, right? An extra couple of dollars turns into some very real savings. Uh, especially, if, yeah, maybe tens or hundreds of dollars would be the difference. Um, so one of, just a quick story, we're good on time. Uh, quick story, um, a lot of these ideas actually came out of, I had a week, I don't know, maybe six months ago, where I probably had 10 different customers within that one week ask me, um, how do I get K3S to run on this hardware with one gig of RAM along with my workload and everything else, right? Um, that's and the a, answer is, you don't. Right? So, I mean, Albert Casusa, I, I, I really like K3S. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it is not the, it's not the silver bullet, right? Um, and so it kind of made me think, and I finally actually got to, there was a customer that it was actually appropriate to have the conversation with where I was like, okay, cool. Why? Why are you asking for this, right? Um, and, and the answer was plain and simple, uh, because everything else in our environment is GitOps. And so we want to be able to make everything GitOps, so completely top to bottom, I'm like, cool, that makes a lot of sense, let's do that. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean Kubernetes, right? It just means overarching should be cloud native. So how do we balance all of these needs while giving a, a, a comparable operator and developer experience, and hopefully a better develop, developer experience? Um, so that's where we, we started looking at actually extending the service mesh. Yeah, it's what we want to do here is instead of having this case where all of these are running in a Kubernetes cluster, we only have some of them running in the cluster and we don't care if the other ones are, right? So this is where we want to get at, wants to end up, where our central sorts of analysis and control loops and such might be running in the Kubernetes cluster on the left, but the instruments are probably just sitting out there, maybe they're running Linux boxes. One of the cool things about the Linkerd proxy is it actually doesn't really care where it runs very much. It's the control plane for Linkerd currently cares a lot about running inside Kubernetes, but the proxy doesn't really care that much. It can run on just the bare Linux boxes. So 
This gives you the benefit, as Andrew was mentioning, you can use smaller, cheaper devices. You can, since you don't have to rewrite your application to get reliability and observability and security into it, it makes it easier to reuse your application in multiple places. Um, and what we ended up doing was basically just running the Linkerd proxy and then doing some extra IP tables and routing on the Linux boxes. Uh, we are, um, this is I don't think we're time. gonna show you <laughs> the code that we used to get the proxy running. Come back in Paris and we'll have a much more elegant story on that front. Uh, but yeah, we do end up with challenges in this case, right? There's one of the challenges is Linkerd requires that all of these proxies share the same root of trust in the system so that MTLS works. That's a little interesting right now. Uh, another one is you get to have a fair amount of entertaining fun with network routing and DNS and things like that. And I am enormously grateful to be able to stand up here and say, Andrew did all of that and I didn't have to do it. But the really cool bit is that Andrew is not a Linkerd expert. Not at all. I am not a Linkerd proxy expert, really. So the fact that we were able to go and talk to the maintainers and find out how to do this without having to go and study for six months to be Linkerd experts is really kind of cool. And yeah, so I, what else do we have before demo time? I, we have nothing. It's, it's, it's demo, demo time. time. Everybody, so I'm going to switch. Everybody pray to the demo gods. This is going to be interesting. You know, nothing like the normal... While he's doing this. Switching different networks and all that. Yeah, while he's doing this, let me point out, we have a Kubernetes cluster running in the laptop. And we have, what is this, a Pi 3? Pi 3. We have a Pi 3 that I'm kind of afraid to touch too much that is running not Kubernetes, but it is running some workload stuff. Um, those are both connected to the same network, which is not the Wi-Fi because... Never, never ever use demos. We use Wi-Fi for demos. Um, but we have the laptop running on its internal battery, and we have our workload running on this external battery. So we are, in fact, doing Kubernetes and industrial applications completely on battery power on an isolated network, which is fine, it right? <laughs> I, it works. Um, yeah. Don't try this at home, kids. Yeah. It burns through my laptop battery faster than it should. But that's... Yeah, but that's your laptop. Yeah. It would actually be a server. Um, I didn't mean to... Whatever. Yeah, so what we've set up is basically I have a Kubernetes cluster running with uh, Linkerd installed um, and the Emoji Voto demo, which uh, I annoyingly didn't actually reset. So there will be a leaderboard here in a moment. Darn. Um, yeah. But it just kind of shows that like nothing's connected at the moment, right? Uh, and then I also have the uh, Raspberry Pi running um, a tool called Cockpit that lets me kind of see what's running uh, in Podman. I can do all the setup that I want. Um, and Basically, all I'm going to do to set all this up is I'm going to apply this job, and then I will talk through it. Um, and let's see if I can talk and type at the same time, which I already know I can't. <laughs> Riskiest part of any demo. Cool. So that will go and run. Uh, and actually, it's probably already done by now. But in that, I, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. I give it some information that I want. Um, I Oh, man, you went and showed them all the stuff. Yeah, yeah, you want to see something. I thought we weren't going to do that. Really ugly bash. <laughs> There's so many things that I just laughed when it worked, right? Um, really what this boils down to is, hey, go and grab the environment yeah. that the proxy needs to know who to talk to. And then, and, go, then go and SSH yeah. out to it and, and you know, yeah. Yeah, about. I don't like that. I know Bash that well. I want to say about 80% of that is around moving certificates around. You know, so instead of going through and going through all the complexity of setting up lots and lots of configure of certificate management, we set up Linkerd, let it do the certificates, and then we steal them from the cluster and stuff them into the pie, which uh, don't do this in production, please. That's it's a very bad idea, but it works great for a demo. Yeah, so 
You can see that we, we have data flowing, right? The, uh, the workload is, uh, is voting on things. Um, and to prove that it's actually going through the proxy, I'm going to go ahead and come, come here, look at the logs. Wait, wait, back up a second. You have the vote bot running on the Pi right now, right? Yes, the vote bot is running okay. on the Pi right now. And I'm going to, I don't know why those are. The, uh, the architecture of that demo, oh, there we go, some of the numbers changed. Yeah. The architecture of that demo is that the vote bot is picking a random emoji to vote for every couple seconds, I think. Like that. Um, and shipping, it's basically just doing a post to the voting workload which is running in the cluster on the laptop. So we have something where the emoji voto vote bot is running in the Pi, talking to the laptop, and then the laptop is showing you all this stuff. And I think now we're going to break that, right? Now we're going to break that. And <laughs> just so that I'm not having to like flip back and forth, we've got some logs that you can see that it's actually like continually voting. And if I come over here and pause the proxy container, it stops. If you let it go for long enough, it'll actually time out. Uh, and then if I resume, it goes again. Ta-da. <laughs> I know. Um, so it doesn't look super impressive, but hey. Um, we could also break it by unplugging the network cables, but I'm not sure I really want to do that. <laughs> I'm not completely sure if it'll come back up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just a real quick on like what the workload looks like that gets applied? Why is this not loading? Because it's a demo and we didn't pray enough to the demo gods. I don't know. Oh, it's red. No, actually, hold on. VS Code broke? Of all the things to break? There we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the workload, the ML is we're using Podman Q Play. And there's an init container that will run all the IP table stuff. Um, there is the actual workload that we care about, and then the proxy uh, stuff as well. Um, and then a fun, like, I'm actually, like, <laughs> using the cube DNS as the DNS name server. Is, why not? And as far as Linkerd is concerned, this business of being able to expand the mesh outside of the cluster is something that's under pretty active development. So come back in Paris, we expect to show off a much nicer demo that'll use Spiffy and not have horrible bash scripts and will just work, at which point we can tell you, hey, just go install Linkerd as a production thing and it'll be beautiful. But we can't do that today, We're close. which makes me sad. Um, yeah, and then that's basically it for the demo. Yeah. Do, do I want to actually attempt to switch back? I think we could just tell them. Yeah. So uh, kind of next up, I'm just going to let it see what happens. <laughs> um, so kind of next um, is, so obviously making this production ready uh, is, yeah, very obviously the next step. But then what I want to do is, I can't see it from my own that's not what I wanted. Whatever. Good enough. It's good enough. <laughs> um, yeah, so the next phase is actually to integrate with Aukri and Apinio. So Aukri allows you to do device discovery and then run uh, pods or jobs or really any workload. Um, when that, uh, that device is discovered. So I'm going to install a MDNS responder on the Raspberry Pi and then a build out a um, MDNS discovery handler so that when that Pi comes onto the network, it uh, runs the setup job, gets set up and, and configured and everything just goes. Um, so then the next piece is, um, I wrote a tool called Apinio a couple years ago that gives you a Cloud Foundry, Heroku, Google App Engine style um, kind of platform as a service uh, that's built on top of Kubernetes. What's really interesting about it is that the output, like the, what's actually installed, is a Helm chart that you can override. So I can make that Helm chart be uh, the Aukri configuration. So as soon as you do uh, an Apinio push, it takes your code, it builds your uh, code into a container, and then it reapplies the Aukri configuration. Um, which means that now you are able to just do Apinio push, and then have that new workload show up on your non-Kubernetes device. Um, 
and yeah. Which will be cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's it for yeah, this. Yeah. Do we have do we have any questions? I think we have about two minutes for questions. Questions? All right. Cool. Either we glazed everybody's eyes over or it actually also, worked out okay I and explained it. Yeah, that's right. that's I'm true. Hungry. That's true. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Thanks so much, guys. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you.